Okay, the Son of Man. So we remember Jesus was asked about who he was and he said he was the Son of Man. Uh, some of the resources that I used here, Jesus, the God of Israel, a, a very good book uh, by Richard Baucom, is an English, uh, Englishman, a uh, very good book. He, he, he writes about Jesus and the God of Israel. So he talks about Jesus in the setting of the uh, Jewish Israel. And he brings out some, some great points uh, about the background. And part of the background is understanding how the people thought of what was going through the mind of the first century Jew. Very important. And one of them was the idea of the Son of Man. Another one is New Testament theology uh, by uh, Joachim Jeremiah. Again, this, this is an older book. Uh, a very good book, uh, a little advanced and, and a little difficult to read. You really got to want to know what he says to get through it. it. It's kind of slow, tedious reading. He uses some Greek phrases uh, without interpretation, without the translation. So you can get away with just slipping past it and just figure out oh, that probably means this. You could probably get away with it. But it, it's hard when you break your reading up like that. It's not a book you can, you know, use Evelyn Wood's speed reading on. <laughs> Won't work very well. And uh, there's also, so, oh, the, uh, the, I didn't put my other book down, did I? Yeah, there it is. Okay. Uh, there's the, the book of Enoch, actually it's Enoch 2, is the parables. Uh, approximately 1st century B.C. to 1st century A.D. It was written right around that early period before Christ or during <coughs> Christ. But not much later. Uh, so that's a resource, and uh, you can find that on, on online. Mm. So if you want to read what we've read, actually I've included part of it. I've, I've taken excerpts out in your in your handouts. Mm -hmm. But that's online there. Uh, the Christology of the New Testament by Oscar Coleman. Oscar Coleman was an old German Lutheran. Uh, uh, rose to a lot of fame in the early 1900s. Uh, excellent book. I, I actually have not finished this yet. But uh, he writes about the Christology here is uh, all the, the titles that were used for Jesus. Jesus the prophet, the servant of suffering, servant of God, the high priest, the Messiah, the son of man. He's got a lot under son of man in here. The Lord, the Savior, the Word, Son of God, and so he can. He in here he writes all the different references that people have used over from the church in the New Testament, anyway, uh, about Jesus and Son of Man is one of them. And if you want to find the Book of Enoch, you could also find a, a not the book but information on it. I always like to caution uh, the Wikipedia. Is, is a quick reference and it's an easy reference but double and triple check it okay mm -hmm. it's, it's and it can be the most accurate it can be and I've had it be very very accurate but I've also found it very inaccurate so uh, the words it has to be something it, it, it they, they have references at the bottom you may want to check some of the references out too this is this is only up here to help you because I found the information they had was pretty good it was actually pretty good uh, on the book of Enoch. So who was the son of man? Most people don't care. They read those verses in, in Matthew, John, and uh, I don't care. Just get through it. I know the story. I know the basic story. But then when they start talking about who was Christ, who did he claim to be, they, 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 they've been... They can easily be taken away from good doctrine, good teachings about Christ, because they don't have a good solid background. And Jesus is uh, what they call uh, his, uh, uh, what do they call it? His knowledge of who he was, who he thought he was. How do we know who Jesus thought he was? I mean, we see a lot of, we read a lot of things about what they say about him, but how do we know that Jesus agreed with all this stuff? 
So we have to take some of the things that Jesus is claimed to say and read that and then see you know, the claims he makes. How does that match up against the claims that people have given him? Why were the Pharisees and the priests offended by Jesus' claim to be the Son of Man? That's what one of the things we're going to talk about. Why were they so offended? Why did they want to stone him as soon as he said he was the Son of Man? Well, he would be having a physical father in that case. It wouldn't be Son of God as opposed to Son of Man. This, would be, well, this is one of the things I will go into. Uh, exactly. Uh, we'll talk about what could and did the, the phrase Son of Man mean, not to us, but to them. What did it mean to them? But didn't Jesus use the term Son of Man to avoid offending the priests and the Pharisees? For a while. For a while he did. But you'll see the way, it's not just, he didn't just say I'm the Son of Man, it's how he, in this setting, before the high priest, he defined it, as you'll find out. And that's what upset them, because now he yeah, okay. said, this is the Son of Man I am, as opposed to others. And we'll see, we'll, we'll, we'll get there eventually. Uh, there's a lot to be, you know, there's not a lot written about the Son of Man. But what is written is really good, and it's really interesting. Uh, so, who is the Son of Man? So, we're going to cover, why were they offended at Him? We're going to cover, what did the Bible say about this Son of Man thing? How many Old Testament references are there? Where are they? What did they say? What about extra-biblical sources? What did they say about Him? You know, these Pharisees weren't just standing around reading the books, reading the scrolls. They were reading other things. We've discovered lots of books in the Qumran community uh, and the Dead Sea Scrolls. They've discovered a lot of books written uh, that are biblical, but some are not bib biblical in the sense of extra biblical. They're writings about the Son of Righteousness. They're writing about other characters. In other words, it's giving us insight into the mind of the first century Jew. What did they believe? What were they reading? Can you imagine a thousand years from now if people Uncover, uncover our civilization and find some of the books that people are, that are on the bestseller list today, oh and they're God, going to judge. They're going to. <laughs> they're going to judge us based upon the books that were popular. Uh, I just, I hope they don't get any, get any, get, uh, any copies of the reality shows on video and oh, play no. them. But that's what we'll be judged upon is the kind of books that people were reading. And that's how we're judging them. What were they thinking about? So this is very helpful. This is why studying history can really help us understand uh, uh, the scriptures. We tend to get locked into our frame of reference. I do too. We tend to just get locked in and say, well, this, what did Jesus say? Oh, I know what that means. <laughs> Well, that maybe didn't mean the same thing as it did 2,000 years ago. What was behind Jesus' use of the term? Why did he use it? And how did he mean it when he used it? Or how many different ways did he mean it when he used it? The title is used of Jesus about 25 times in the New Testament. Yeah, I noticed that well, also <coughs> something very strange about this title. It was only used in the dialogue of Jesus during that time. It was not used by Paul or Peter or anyone else in the letters. He was never called the Son of Man. So we have to kind of explain that too. So there's some, there's some mystery here that we have to deal with. Okay, one of the terms that we need to come become familiar is, is the exalted servant concept, which we get from the Old Testament, from Isaiah mostly. In Hebrew, 
it's called, or Hebrew or in, in Aramaic, it's called the Ebed, Ebed Yahweh. And with Yahweh we're familiar with. The Ebed Yahweh, servant of the Lord, servant of Yahweh. And uh, Jehovah, uh, Isaiah speaks about him in chapter 53. And he says, look, my servant will succeed. He will be elevated, lifted high, and greatly exalted. And he goes on to say this. And the background here is Grunewald, Grunewald's crucifixion. And I found this picture extremely relative to the text. Just as many were horrified by the sight of you, he was so disfigured, he no longer looked like a man. His form was so marred, he no longer looked human. So now he'll startle many nations. Kings will be shocked by his exaltation, for they will witness something unannounced to them, and they will understand something they had not heard about. This is Isaiah speaking about this. And the picture here seems to be perfect for the text, because Isaiah is talking about somebody who's human, who no longer looks like a human. He's been disfigured. But... He was exalted. And the exaltation and the disfigurement and the suffering are simultaneous. They come together. And he talked about he will be lifted up. Exalted. So now let's look at that idea in John. Now my soul is greatly distressed. And what should I say? Father... Deliver me from this hour? No, but for this very reason I've come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it. And I will glorify it again. And the crowd that stood there and heard the voice said that it had thundered. Another said that an angel had spoken to him. And Jesus said, This voice has not come for my benefit but for yours. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And now he said this to indicate clearly what kind of death he was going to die. And then the crowd responded, We've heard from the law that the Christ will remain forever. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? And Jesus replied, The light's with you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, so that the darkness may not overtake you. And the one who walks in the darkness does not know where he's going. So we have some clues from Isaiah that are now directly related to Jesus. He's being lifted up from the earth. This lifted up is kind of an ambiguous act. Jesus was lifted up. He was exalted. But his exaltation comes through suffering. This is what brings the term the suffering servant of Yahweh, Ebed Yahweh, this brings us together in Christ. In Philippians, a very famous, actually kind of a poem, we might say. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. As a result, God exalted him and gave him the name that's above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Again, we take some words here that were purposely inserted, purposely given, uh, that God exalted him. That's what Isaiah says about the suffering servant, about the Abed Yahweh. He'll be exalted. He'll suffer, but he will be exalted. And Philippians, Paul tells us the same thing. He is exalted and given the name above every name. And we'll talk about that later, because there's, there's a verse in Revelation I, I want to point out. But I want you to keep that in mind. He was given a name 
He gave him a name above every name. We know that this is probably pointing to something in the realm of Yahweh, in the, in the realm of, of Jehovah, or the name of the, the uh, unspeakable name, the name above every name. Okay, he says, biblical references, there's, as we talked about, and I'm sure you have heard some of you comment already, that you think that the term, uh, um, um, what is the term again? Um, son of man? Son of man, yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, that the son of man is kind of an ambiguous term, isn't it? And we know that Jesus was kind of an ambiguous character in many ways. And we think, well, wait a second. This, this idea about uh, the Son of Man can be used in a lot of different ways. How do we know how he was using it? So let's look at some of the ways. We have some biblical references that tell us that it, it could refer to him as a human being. In Job, we see this. If even the moon is not bright and the stars are not pure as far as he's concerned, how much less a mortal man who is but a maggot, a son of man, who is only a worm. Obviously, he's talking about a human being. We're the maggots. Speak for yourself, Bob. Okay, okay. I'm a maggot. Uh, so he had the Son of Man. Jesus may have been speaking about himself as the Son of Man in this context, in the context of Job. And he was. Sometimes. <laughs> the phrase, the Son of Man, occurs 93 times in the book of Ezekiel. Well, there's, a, there's an overuse of the term there, huh? 93 mm -hmm. times. It, seems, it, it simply means human one and distinguishes the prophet from the non-human beings that are present in the world of his vision. So when we want to distinguish, when, when uh, Ezekiel, who had lots of visions, I talked about lots of, lots of very high spiritual things, when he wanted to talk about man to make sure it was clear, he would call him the son of man. So that's kind of another example of a human being. But there's times that he's spoken of in, in a sense where maybe he's human, maybe he's angelic, or maybe he's semi-divine. In Daniel, he says about the Son of Man, I was watching in the night visions, and with the clouds of the sky, like one like a Son of Man was approaching. He went up to the Ancient of Days and was escorted before him. So I folded kind of these words that will jump out at us later on. With the clouds of the sky, he saw this one. And he goes by the Ancient of Days. Who's that Ancient of Days? God. Huh? God. God. Yeah, God. The Ancient of Days is a circumlocution for God. Uh, and he's escorted before God. To him was given ruling authority, honor, sovereignty. That's power to rule. Uh, all peoples, nations, and language groups were serving him. His authority is eternal and will not pass away. His kingdom will not be destroyed. So in this particular case, the Son of Man is a little more than human. Maybe a little less than God. I'm well, not sure. See, that's why we, we've got that ambiguity. Who is this guy? Well, this is the great mystery of Daniel. Who is this Son of Man? Whoever it's going to be, he's going to have ruling authority, honor, and sovereignty over all peoples, all languages. Uh, his kingdom will not pass away and not be destroyed. And he'll come with the clouds in the sky. Wow. That's some character. In both Jewish and Christian circles, the reference in the book of Daniel was tradi or has traditionally been understood to refer to an individual, usually in a messianic sense. Uh, meaning in the sense of what they call eschatology. Remember we talked about that the, the final days, the end days. Usually this Messiah is going to come during the end times. 
Many modern scholars, however, understand the reference to have a corporate identity. In this view, the Son of Man is to be equated with the Holy Ones, or the people of the Holy Ones, and understood as a reference to the Jewish people. Others understand Daniel's reference to be uh, the angel Michael. So, there's all sorts of ideas that in Daniel, this could refer to a man, it could refer to the Jewish people. It could also refer to the angel Michael. He wasn't a man, though. Wasn't a man? He wasn't a man. No, for, yeah, the, under this topic, the, these all the possibilities here. He oh. could be human, angelic, or semi-divine, if there is such a thing, a semi-divine being, or at least a, a, a being that we have to wonder, is this human, angelic, or divine? because he seems to have divine attributes here. So you can see, if you were a Jew before Christ, how confusing would this be? What are you, what, who is the Messiah? What are you looking forward to? They didn't know. They really didn't know what the Messiah was going to be. They kind of formulated, some of them, formulated an idea about the Messiah that he was going to be like a general. He was going to be a commander to come and eventually rule over the Romans and, and, and so forth. But, but again, this is one idea they had of the Messiah. There were many ideas of the Messiah. It was not... Today, we talk about Christ the Messiah. Yeah, cut and dry. We know what that is. But the question is, do we really know what that is? The Jews didn't know what it meant to be the Messiah. It was very confusing to them. Is, and especially when we talk about, is the, Christ, is the Christ or the Messiah the suffering servant? No, it can't be, because the suffering servant is going to suffer and be lifted up, uh, but the, the Messiah is going to be a ruling general who comes in on a white horse. Those are two opposing ideas. So it must be two different people. And then we speak, it also speaks about the prophet. Well, that must be a third guy then. So they had all these ideas kind of, kind of blending around in a blender, uh, trying to figure out who's who, you know, who's who. There's no reason that it cannot have both a corporate and an individual identity. In other words, there's no reason, not only that, but there's no reason there can be a blending of this or different ideas of this. And we'll see. Now, extra biblical references to the Son of Man. Now, you've probably, if you've read a lot of Old Testament, you've probably read some of those verses already. Okay? But now these are the verses that you probably haven't read. What else besides the Old Testament were those Jews reading before and during the life of Christ that helped form opinions of the identity of the Son of Man? So they heard the term Son of Man and they were probably just as interested in it. Who is the Son of Man? So it comes about uh, that they begin to read other books about the Son of Man. Books that have not quite made it into their scriptures, but yet books that were very interesting. Books that seem to have, seem to say something, seem to be prophetic, but they were not quite there. Yeah? I don't think the average <coughs> Jewish person the people that spoke just Aramaic and didn't speak Greek mm -hmm. were reading anything, if you want my humble opinion. Um, I think the Sadducees and the Pharisees may have been reading other yeah. books, yeah. but I don't think that Peter and all of the, the twelve let alone all of the thousands yeah. of disciples were reading much of it. No, thanks, for, thanks for bringing that up, because when I said the Jews, in my mind, I was thinking about the elite. I was okay. thinking about the Pharisees and Sadducees and the priests. Those who had availability of the scrolls. Now, there, there were probably some wealthy people, and there were wealthy people who also had availability to the scrolls that would read 
other other things, and we also have the uh, 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 the Qumran community, the Essenes, the Essenes yeah. who also did a lot of reading. Yeah, but just like uh, uh, Trish says, the average you know run of the mill Jew heard these things from their rabbis. Mm -hmm. Uh, they heard the scriptures read every Sunday, and they memorized things. You know, they, they, just like a Sunday school, they, would, you know, probably a little bit more. Uh, uh, what would be a little more, not radical, but uh, more of a almost like a regular school. You know, they probably had homework and had to memorize things and so forth. But uh, yeah, th that's uh, a, a good point. So we're talking about mostly the people. Uh, who either were well-to-do or people who, where theology was their business. They were, they were in the political structure of Judaism. Uh, oh. I have a question. Sometimes you capitalize, son of man, oh. and sometimes you don't. Uh, some of that, I have to admit, is sloppiness. Uh, <laughs> some of it is quotations from other people where they don't, pop, they don't capitalize it, so I, I don't correct it. But if Son of Man is used as a title, it ought to be capitalized. Okay. Uh, so I don't know. Some of it could be my sloppiness. I'll, I'll admit to that. Was it on that other page there? Um, when you refer in Daniel 7, 13 through 14. Okay, yeah, I didn't. This is again a quotation. All here. right. I, hopefully, and, I, uh, the same thing in quotes, Son of Man. Later, yeah. Yeah. I, I kind of try to allow the, the author had his way. That's how he wanted to write it, but I, but I would capitalize it just to show it was a title. Now, one of these books that they read was called The Parables of Enoch. And uh, again, it, it was written during the time about a hundred years before Christ, absolutely no later than 70 A.D., but more likely closer to before, uh, maybe even in the early days of Christ. It may have even been that mm -hmm. close to the time. We're not sure. It's awful hard to tell. But uh, the, 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 what would I say? The credible references will be it no later than 70 AD. Uh, and in there, it has some very important, and they are Jewish, they are also, they are, Jewish writings. They are not Christian writings. They are not Jewish Christian writings. They are Jewish Hebrew writings. This has been resolved by the experts in the field. Even Wikipedia, which is very, very liberal, in my opinion, even show that, admit to it, that these are Jewish writings, not Christian writings. You call? No. Okay. So what's the significance? Some of the writings we're going to talk about here is the, about the throne of God. One of the things we need to remember about the throne of God, or think about, is standing by the throne. We, we read references about standing by the throne. Most exalted angels serve God. They do not participate in His rule. They never sit with God on His heavenly throne. They serve in the posture of servants. Secondly, not only are they never worshipped, but they explicitly reject worship. Angelic beings do not get to sit on the throne. They stand by the throne. And they worship God. That's what they do. That's the references of the angels. Okay, so let's see. What does Enoch say in 48? He says, And at that hour the Son of Man was named in the presence of the Lord of Spirits, and His name before the head of days. Now you may read some terms that aren't in Scripture, because this is not Scripture. I don't want to emphasize, not Scripture, but books, the reason it's up here is books they were reading at that time, that were, they might have considered them quasi-Scripture, quasi-Scripture, almost Scripture, but the decision was still not made yet whether they were going to make it. They were too new. Yea, before the sun and the signs were created, before the stars of the heaven were made, his name was named before the Lord of Spirits. This is the Son of Man we're talking about. Mm -hmm. he, shall be, uh, uh, he shall be a staff to the righteous, where upon, whereon to stay themselves and not fall. And he shall be the light of the Gentiles. 
and the hope of those who are troubled of heart. All who dwell on earth shall fall down and worship before him. He will, uh, and will praise and bless and celebrate with song the Lord of Spirits. And for this reason hath he been chosen and hidden before him, before the creation of the world and forevermore. And so that's a little bit, a little bit about the Son of Man. Give us a little... You know what's good about that, though, is the light of the Gentiles. Yeah, you notice some things jump out at you, don't they, when you read this. Light of the Gentiles. Also, also he would be the hope to those of trouble of heart. That was one of the main themes of Christ. You who are of a troubled heart. Well, now we'll talk about more worship of the Son of Man. In Enoch 62... And the kings and the mighty and all who possess the earth shall bless and glorify and extol him who rules over all, who was hidden. And all the kings and the mighty and the exalted and those who rule the earth shall fall down before him on their faces and worship and set their hope upon that son of man and petition him and supplicate for mercy at his hands. This is the Son of Man we're talking about. Now we'll talk a little bit about what Enoch had to say about sitting on the throne and versus standing by the throne. In, verse, in chapter 47, In those days I saw the head of days when he seated himself upon the throne of his glory. And the books of the living were opened before him and all his host which is in heaven and above, and his counselors stood before him. <coughs> the, the head of days, I should have bolded this to make it jump out a little more. When he seated himself on the throne of his glory. Who's the head of days here, do you think? God. God. So when God seated himself on the throne of glory, want to make that clear, who's sitting on the throne? God. God, God is sitting on the throne. Enoch 60, disquieted, uh, this is the rest of a, a sentence that for some reason they added it. And the head of days sat on the throne of his glory, and the angels and the righteous stood around him. Again, I want to show the comparison. God sits on the throne, the angels stand beside the throne. This reminds me of the book of Revelation. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. The book of Revelation. Opening the book and so forth. Yep. This, now, uh, judgment and the throne. Let's talk about a little more judgment. The Son of Man is hidden in heaven until the time of eschatological judgment. This isn't the scripture. This is information that I, I pulled out of the book. The Son of Man is hidden in heaven until the time of the eschatological judgment. His role is primarily to execute judgment as he sits upon God's throne. Uh, this is obtained here from Enoch 45. On that day, mine elect one shall sit on the throne of glory and shall try their works, and their places of rest shall be innumerable. So the, the elect one, the elect one, hmm, that sounds like the word Messiah. And he'll try their works. Sounds familiar. Yes. And their souls shall grow strong within them, and when they see mine elect ones, and those who have called upon my glorious name. Okay. Call upon my name. It's a little ambiguous too. What's the name we call upon? We call upon Jesus. We call Jesus. We call upon the name of Jesus. In a 55, ye mighty kings who dwell on the earth, Ye shall have to behold mine elect one, how he sits on the throne of glory and judges Azazel, and all his associates, and all his hosts in the name of the Lord of Spirits. Somebody's going to be sitting on the throne of God, and it's the elect one. And this elect one is actually referred to as the Son of Man. Who sits on the throne of God? Jesus. God. God. Enoch 61. 
And the Lord of Spirits, which would be comparable to the Lord of Hosts, okay? the Lord of Spirits placed the elect one on the throne of glory. And he shall judge all the works of the holy above in the heaven, and in the balance shall their deeds be weighed. So whoever's going to sit on this throne is going to do some heavy judging. He's going to judge the world and the holy ones and the angels and everything. Enoch 60. This quiet... Oh, we, we actually read this one here, but it came in two places. It talks about, again, uh, that he's going to sit in his glory and the angels uh, righteous stood around him. In 71, and round about him were seraphim, cherubim, and uh, ophanim, uh, different kinds of angel, angelic beings. And these are they who sleep not and guard the throne of his glory. In other words, the angels were guarding the throne of glory. They weren't sitting on the throne, but they were guarding the throne. The Son of Man and Judgment. 62. And the Lord of Spirits seated him on the throne of his glory, and the spirit of righteousness was poured out upon him, and the word of his mouth slays all the sinners, and all the unrighteous are destroyed from before his face. And one portion of them shall look on the other, and they shall be terrified, and they shall be downcast of continents, and pain shall seize them. And when they see that Son of Man sitting on the throne of his glory, Now, notice we talked about Revelation. Oh, um, where was it? Where was it now? I read it. And the, oh, and the word of his mouth slays all their sinners. Do you remember the, 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 the being who was riding upon the horse had a tongue, a, a sword came out of his mouth. Do you remember that uh, picture? Uh, to destroy. You know, the, his word was like a sword, in other words. His word was like a sword. This kind of fits into that same application. But the main sentence is the last one here. When they see that the Son of Man sitting on the throne of his glory, that was reserved for God. So that kind of makes you scratch your head. No, because the Son of Man when we think of Jesus, is a part of God. Okay, okay. And of course, that's coming after, after this, but... Okay, but... Okay, we're thinking in the a, same, we're thinking yes. in the same mold. Enoch 69, And he sat on the throne of his glory, and the sum of judgment was given unto the Son of Man. And he caused the sinners to pass away and be destroyed from off the face of the earth, and those who have led the world astray. Mm -hmm. And from henceforth there shall be nothing corruptible, for that Son of Man has appeared, and has seated himself on the throne of his glory, and all evil shall pass away before his face, and the word of that Son of Man <coughs> shall go forth, and be strong before the Lord of Spirits. Again, I want to remind you, this is what the Jews were reading before Christ. This is what they were reading about the Son of Man. To form those opinions of who is the Son of Man. This is all, this is my whole point. Enoch 51. And the elect one shall in those days sit on my throne. In other words, you're constantly reinforcing. He's sitting on the throne. And his mouth shall pour forth all the secrets of wisdom and counsel. For the Lord of Spirits hath given them to him and hath glorified him. So, the summation. The Son of Man in the parables of Enoch is unique among exalted human or angelic figures depicted in Second Temple Jewish literature in two respects. He sits on the divine throne and he receives worship. The two main facts I want to make. The Son of Man is going to be a being to be worshipped and he's going to be a being who makes judgment, and he's going to be sitting on the throne of God. There's little doubt that the Son of Man depicted by these parables was a divine expression of God who shared rule as well as judgment with God. 
It's no wonder that the Pharisees and the high priests took great offense when a mere man took upon himself this title. Now you're beginning to see why they got so angry. It is possible that at first Jesus used this phrase as was used by Ezekiel to merely lay claim to his humanity. But as his ministry developed, it became clear that Jesus' intention went beyond mere humanity and reflected a claim of divinity. He did use the title Son of Man in many places. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't want to make this too long, too lengthy of a, of a, of a class, but yeah. Humanity, you just mentioned humanity. Isn't humanity, humans, man, God's crowning achievement of creation? Because early on they mm -hmm. referred to humanity as maggots, or nothing but maggots. <laughs> yeah. We've got to redeem God's... them a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And there, there's again, there's a complementary, instead of contradictory, it's more complementary. Yes, we've turned into maggots. But we are God's crowning glory because we have the potential to worship God in a way that no other creature can worship God. We can love God in a way that animals can't love God, at least we perceive. And even more than angels, we are the, the, crowning, the crowning glory of God's creation because we can have the best, closest relationship with Him of any other being ever, ever created. That's our glory. That's our potential. We're all a work in progress. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> well, hopefully in the right direction we're progressing. Uh, so, yes, yeah, he did, Jesus did, and as you read it, you'll see that Jesus uses the term Son of Man in different ways. Uh, what is it? Foxes have holes, but the Son of Man has no place to rest his head. So he's not really talking about some divine being. He's talking about his humanity. What a great term, though, the Son of Man, because it reflects such ambiguity. He can say out in the open about the Son of Man, and nobody knows for sure who he's talking about. <laughs> he was so Until the very end when he makes it clear. Now, this is how I mean it. Uh, actually, what I should have done, I, I should have done is reread does anybody have last week's lesson with them? I should have read, I should have had on here, Jesus' reply to the high priests. Now that we have all this momentum going. Yeah, are you the Christ? He said, you said it that I am. You said that I am, but then he said, but. Yeah, okay. Okay, so this is in uh, uh, page 145, after they arrested Jesus. And uh, let's see, verse 2662. So the high priest stood up and said to him, Have you no answer? What is this that they are testifying against you? But Jesus was silent, and the high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us, if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And by that, what he is saying is, I am placing you under an oath. You know, involuntarily. You are under an oath. You know, don't raise your right hand or anything like that, but you're under an oath. Tell me. Are you the Son of are you the Christ, the Son of God? And Jesus said to him, You said it yourself. But I tell you, from now on you will see. The Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest tore his clothes and declared, he's blasphemed. Why do we still need witnesses? So, I just wanted you to be aware. And I think if you read some of the other versions of, of what Jesus says, you'll see he even goes in a little bit more into the idea. And he comes on the clouds. This idea of coming on the clouds sounds innocuous, but it isn't. If you want to look through the whole Old Testament, there's only one who comes on the clouds. 
Who is that one who comes upon on the cloud? God. No other human being comes on the clouds. And then there's the Son of Man. So there's certainly a connection between the two. Okay, some questions for you guys now. Now this is going to take a little thought. Uh, most of my questions don't usually take any thought. But this one. Why did Jesus believe... Who did Jesus believe he was and how did he know this? How do we know that Jesus really thought he was the Christ, the Son of God, the Son of Man? How do we know that? How did he know it? Could there be any doubt? I, what? Oh, I love it. Before you, I know we don't have a definitive answer for this. We can't, we can't possibly know. But we're going to speculate here a little bit. Based upon how we know things, let's see if we can kind of uh, project that onto Christ a little bit. Go ahead, Trey. I was going to say, when he was a young man, when he got lost from his parents in the temple, okay. I think at that point he knew that there was something special about him. Okay. But I don't really think that he... I think in the, the three years, from 30 to 33, yeah. as his ministry grew, his understanding of what his role on earth even though he came from God, mm -hmm. but he had to be born as a man. So as a man, he was living, and he was getting these maybe flashes, and this is all co conjure on my part. Okay. But I think he was coming to know what it was God wanted. And I don't think he knew that mm -hmm. from the moment of birth, or even as a 12-year-old boy. I think that grew in him and developed in him as he... Yeah, matured, but also as understood, experienced, life. experienced his role as a man mm -hmm. and what it was the Father needed him to do in order to save mankind. Mm -hmm. I think he did not know that he was the salvation for mankind initially. Now, you've, you've thought about this before, haven't you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it shows. That's very intuitive of you. Really, it's very He's intuitive. He's been wandering for three years. And he's had nowhere to lay his head, really. Yeah, yeah. So, some people might think that he was born with this knowledge. That he was born, and he said, I'm the Christ. Well, I better get out there and get busy. <laughs> and I can't say that's not true. I can say that uh, 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 what Trisha's saying is that he was born like any one of us, but there was something different. Something different, the way he thought, how he thought. And I, I've got an answer up here. Hopefully it's as good as Trisha's, but maybe not. Trisha's is a very good answer. Uh, who did he believe he was? At the end, he believed he was Christ. He was on the cross, and he, had, he called his father. Okay. Good. That's, that's, again, very intuitive. He called God his Father. Right. That must have been some kind of clue of Jesus's... I can't think of the right word they had, but Jesus's self-concept of who he was. Like, we have a concept of who we are, don't we? So that's what I'm kind of building my answer on, is I kind of learned who I am as I get older, but it's based on one real factor as far as who I really am as far as who I think I am. Okay? I'll see if, see if I clear that up here. Jesus indicated or rather implied through the many comments that he made who he was. The Son of God by calling God his Father. Son of Man, Messiah, Lord, Suffering Servant, Salvation of God. There's all sorts of scriptures that imply this. He may not have said it directly. I will agree with the critics. Some of these things he didn't say directly. But indirectly, he hinted by not, in, in many ways, the hint was in not denying it. Okay? If, if he wasn't something and somebody called him something, if he was an honest man, he'd say, no, I am not that something. When John the Baptist was approached, are you the Christ? Well, did, John, did John answer some enigmatic statement? Well, I don't know. Maybe I am. 
It's up to you to figure it out. Now what did John say? Emphatically, no, no, I'm not the Christ. Okay, so I want to make that clear. We cannot know exactly how he came to this knowledge, but it's a good indication that it was through his perfect relationship with God that he had through perfect faith. In the same way we come to know that we're sinners saved by grace through our relationship with God, Jesus came to know the role that he would play as mediator between God and man. We learn from Scripture that he was perfected through his suffering. In this regard, we can assume that Jesus became aware of himself through his experiences, performing miracles, answers to prayer, suffering, his compassion, uh, and his unique awareness of God as his Father, etc. Does that sound like what you were saying, Trish? Okay. Okay. So, in other words, as we become aware of ourselves that we're sinners, the only time we know that is in God's presence, when we come before God. Well, Jesus was always before God, you understand? He was always perfect with God. He always had a perfect faith, a perfect relationship with God. We don't. So we're not going to really come to know who we are until we finally come before God and have that relationship that helps define us. That's what defines us in truth. If we don't come before God, everything else is just opinion. <laughs> right? <laughs> we don't know if we're really that person or not. It's just an opinion. Okay, why didn't Jesus proclaim his perceived identity to the Jews? Why was he so secretive? They call it Mark's uh, secret message uh, or proclamation. Why didn't Jesus tell the Jews who he was right from the get-go? Okay. Wasn't it because he wanted them to come to an understanding of it and not just preach it to them and say, this is what I am? Yeah. Very good. Very good. The, the importance lies not in knowing, but in revelation. Was that to say? Were you going to say the same thing? And also, they were very violent people. They were? And, and he would never have even had his three years mm -hmm. to, uh, to finish the whole... Uh -huh. the whole thing. Well, now, it, it, what I prefaced about the Jews and their understanding of the Messiah, what do you think they would have thought if Jesus said, I am the Messiah? How clear would their understanding have been as to what that meant? Not very clear. Because they had really no clue who the Messiah was. They knew there was supposed to be a Messiah, but they really didn't have a handle on it. And if Jesus made the claim, it would have been a confusing claim. It wouldn't have been... See, see, we're judging Jesus based upon what we know of the Messiah today, what we know of the Christ today, and think, why didn't he just tell them? Well, that wouldn't have helped. Because they didn't know who the Messiah was. He needed to live his life. And we'll talk about that here. Our God is a God of revelation, not proclamation. It was not Jesus' way to label himself with names and titles, but rather to do the will of God and perform the function for which God had brought him forth. Titles and names too easily become objectified. We use them to help us communicate ideas, but there's obviously a danger in forgetting the person behind the name or the title. Jesus was here to accomplish a mission and not take upon himself any glory given by men in the form of titles, but to wait for the glory given to him by God, which was the name above all names. The title above all titles. That's the title he was interested in. He, he wasn't interested in the title of calling him Christ. He was interested in performing the function he had to perform. Names and titles help define us, but they also confine us. They describe one unique characteristic about us, but at the same time limit us to that function or identity alone. To take upon one title, even Messiah, would have limited Christ to that one small function. But Christ is much bigger than that one Thing. That's what we've got to try to understand as his disciple. 
God is so big, Christ is so big, He cannot be contained in a name or a title. Revelations. I remember this just this morning here. In 19, um, in 1911, Then I saw heaven open, and there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, which is uh, like crowns. And he has a name inscribed that no one knows but himself. The true title, the true name of God, the true name of Christ is so great it's beyond our understanding and we've got to realize that. We want to put him, and critics want to put him into a little box, the little Christ box. But no, no, he's not going to fit in that box. He's more than just the Christ. He's greater. He's beyond. He's so great that we can't put this man into a name. His name, only he knows it, according to Revelation. That's just a little verse that slips by us, right? But that's, I think, the meaning, the significance of it is so great that it's beyond our ability to conceive it. And, uh, so. <laughs> the end. So. All right. Is that all there was? <laughs> That's all I could find. Um, find a little harder next time. <laughs> so I hope you got something out of the Son of Man, and now it becomes more meaningful. Now the next time you read the Gospel and you read the Son of Man, you'll know why those priests reacted the way they did. Why they were so offended and called that blasphemy. You're claiming to be the Son of Man, the one who sits on the throne of God, the one who's going to judge us? <laughs> well, that's worthy of death, my friend. Yeah. Yeah. You see? That was what really sparked them off. Okay. Anybody have any, any questions on that? Feel free to... This is the first time in a few weeks that I can leave without being confused. <laughs> well, now I don't feel like I've done my job. <laughs> uh, thank, thank you, that's good. Yeah, today was kind of a, a good day to sit back and, and yeah. just kind of wonderful. enjoy. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Today was a day of motivation and try to... What would I call it? Just hopefully, just rise, your, raise your spirits up, uh, get you out there. Okay, let you go on to the next step, which is the church. See if the pastor can top this one. <laughs> <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for visiting us today, for helping us to understand the mysteries that remain mysteries, and that are mysteries for a reason. Uh, help us to know our limitations but yet to worship you in what we do know of you, knowing that there's so much more of you. So we thank you for that gift, for that knowledge. We pray that you'll be with us today, continue to watch over us, um, and those who are unable to be here today. Uh, we thank you again, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.